Um, today we're going to be continuing our study in the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, we've been uh, studying this for a long time, it seems like, doesn't it? But I promise you, next week you're going to get a break from the book of Acts, because next week is Sunday before Memorial Day, and so next week we're going to do a Memorial Day uh, sermon. But today we're looking at a section from the book of Acts. It's right at the end of Acts chapter 15. Remember, the book of Acts is the history book of the New Testament, written by Luke as part two of Luke's gospel. It just takes up the story where Luke ended his gospel and takes it for about the next 30 years or so. Uh, until the Apostle Paul ends a two-year house arrest in the city of Rome. And it was during that house arrest that he single-handedly changed the world by writing letters and ministering to people that came in and out of that house where he was arrested. And it was an incredible thing. Sometimes, uh, you know, we, we wonder why things go like they go. I'm quite sure that Paul was not totally content to be under house arrest for two years in the city of Rome waiting to be tried. I'm pretty sure that he was having a little struggle trying to figure out why God had him under house arrest in Rome for two years. I'm sure it was only after the fact that he could look back on that and say that during that time of ministry under house arrest in Rome for those two years, God did such incredible things through him that it actually changed the history of the world. You see, we can't always understand why God is allowing to happen what's happened when we're in the midst of it, especially if it's unexpected and unpleasant. But most of the time when we get through that and we can look back on it, we can say, wow, look what God did during that season of my life. And so today we're going to continue our study of the book of Acts. And, and in this section, we're going to have a, a, a real down-to-earth, nitty-gritty kind of story. And you know, the Bible is full of those. Sometimes the Bible thinks, uh, people think that the Bible is just a, a book of really good stories. And it is good stories, but not all of the stories have a happy ending. Did you ever notice that? Some of the stories are not good stories. Some of the stories show the reality of the human condition um, when, when, when we struggle through this world. How many of you are believers? You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know you got the gift of eternal life. Okay, awesome. But how many of you that are believers also struggle from day to day, week to week, trying to figure out which way I'm supposed to be going? And, and, and how many of you sometimes ask yourself the question after doing something you know you shouldn't have done, why in the world did I do that? And, and you have struggles like that. I want you to know that every Christian in every generation has struggled with that. And we're going to see that even the greatest of Christians struggled with that kind of issue. Doing things and having attitudes and, and approaching life from a way that causes us to, to not be the most pleasant and agreeable and, and cooperative people. And, and that happens. And when you get people together like that, you're oftentimes going to have disagreements, aren't you? I'm amazed at people who think that a church should never have any disagreements. They're living in fairyland. Churches have disagreements because churches are made up of people and people are sinners. And from time to time, we're not going to see things the same way and we're going to disagree. The important question is not are we going to disagree. The important question is how are we going to handle the disagreements when they come? That's the important question is. And, and that's what we're going to see today. We're going to learn a little bit of wisdom about how to handle the disagreements that come along in life. And we're going to get this from this story about the two missionaries, Paul and Barnabas. Two of the big guys in the first church. Two of the spiritual giants in the first century. Two people that God used to impact the world in a tremendous way. But they had a disagreement. They had a fuss. And it got so severe that they actually stopped working together and started working independently for Jesus. And we're going to see how this all worked out and we're going to learn some important questions about how to handle disagreements from this. So the missionaries disagree. Let's read Acts chapter 15, verse number 39. It's in your bulletin. For those of you who have trouble seeing the screen, and then it's on the screen for those of you who are 40 or under that can see the screen from that distance. And so I, I used to not ever think about that, but I think about that more as I go along. So they had a sharp disagreement. They, they had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Now that's talking about Paul and Barnabas, these two missionaries. God is using them to get people saved. They're baptizing people. Churches are being started. Incredible things are happening. And in the middle of all that, they had a sharp disagreement, such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Now, this section of the book of Acts that we're going to examine in, in this particular lesson contains what I call a bittersweet story. It has a bitter component because a severe conflict erupted between the missionaries, Paul and Barnabas. That's kind of bitter, isn't it? That's kind of sad. That's kind of something that we don't want to hear about. Uh, Luke wrote about it in, in the first part of Acts chapter 15, verse number 39. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. 
But then it has a sweet component because it announces the beginning of Paul's second great missionary journey. A missionary journey that had such a huge impact on the world that the world of his day, controlled by the Roman Empire, went from viewing Christianity as an illegal religion in the empire to less than two generations later, sanctioning Christianity as the state-approved religion of the entire Roman Empire. What an impact the world experienced because of that second missionary journey. And the story that we're going to read about today announces the beginning of that. It says, Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus. After their disagreement, Barnabas took Mark, another guy, the guy that he wanted to take that caused the, the, the disruption anyway, and, and, and they sailed for Cyprus. That was an island out of the Mediterranean Sea. But Paul chose Silas and left commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Strengthening the churches. That was the goal of the second missionary journey, was to strengthen the churches. So now let's look at this story in its context. The story of the disagreement. The story begins with Paul promising, or Paul proposing to Barnabas that they embark on a second journey during which they would check on the churches they had planted during the first journey and see how they were doing. They were going to go back and do a health checkup on the churches, checking the spiritual health of the churches that they started on that first journey, making sure that they were developing and growing and going in the right direction. Luke wrote about that in verse number 36. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Don't we need somebody to check on us occasionally and see how we're doing? Left to our own, left as an island all by ourselves, with nobody trying to inject into our lives and investing in who we are, we wouldn't be motivated to stay on the right track. Isn't that true? Don't you do better when you know somebody's watching? You do, don't you? And so we all need that. And so the missionaries understood that. So they said, let's go back and check on these churches and see how they're doing. Paul evidently realized that evangelism alone isn't enough. They had done evangelism on the first missionary journey. Evangelism is, is sharing the gospel with people in a way they can understand it and believe it and receive eternal life. It's telling people the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Evangelism is telling people the good news that God loves them and that Jesus came and lived and died and rose again so he could save them. That's evangelism. And they had done that on the first journey, but they realized that wasn't enough. It's not enough just to get people saved. It's not enough just to make converts. These missionaries now sensed that these new believers needed to be discipled so that they would become consistent, devoted followers of Jesus. You see, we need to win people to Christ. We need to tell them the good news so they can be saved. But then we need to disciple them. We need to train them to be disciples or followers of Jesus. We need to help them become consistent, devoted followers of Jesus. And that's what disciples is, discipleship is. And that must have been what Paul had in mind when he proposed to Barnabas, let's go back. Let's go back and visit the believers and see how they're doing. After all, Jesus had said right before he left the world that we need to help people become disciples, not just converts. This is what he said in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Go and make disciples, not make converts, not just get believers, but go and help these believers be transformed into consistent and devoted followers of Jesus. So go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and then teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So you see, it's a pretty simple prospect here. Once somebody becomes a believer, then we're supposed to make disciples of them. And we do that first by baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then by teaching them to obey everything that Jesus commanded. Discipleship has two components to it. First, get baptized. Go public with your faith. Tell everybody that's watching that I believe that Jesus lived and died and rose again. And by my act of baptism, I'm declaring that to you. When I step into the water, I'm saying, I believe that Jesus died for me. When they put you under the water, you're saying, I believe that Jesus was buried for me. And when we raise you up out of the water, it's like saying, I believe that Jesus rose again so he could give me eternal life. And that makes him a Lord worth following. 
That's what baptism is. And that's what he said to do. If you're going to make disciples, first baptize them, and then teach them to obey everything that Jesus commanded. And so that's what we're supposed to be doing. And then he gives this promise. Surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. We can't really claim God's presence, God's protective, providing, empowering presence unless we're doing what he said to do, which is to make disciples of all nations. So you see, it isn't enough to simply make converts. That's people who believe in Jesus. We are commanded as his people to make disciples. That's people who consistently follow Jesus. Unfortunately, Christians sometimes have unpleasant disagreements, don't we? Even though we're supposed to be making disciples and even though, so we, even though we get excited about people being saved and all that sort of thing, we sometimes have unpleasant disagreements. And this story from the book of Acts is a clear illustration of that fact. Luke described this sharp disagreement between Paul and Barnabas. Even though people were being saved and they're planning now a discipleship strategy to help those people grow and become consistent followers of Jesus, even though all of that was going on, a disagreement arose. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. And they had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. That's the story. The proposal to do a second journey and the disagreement over whether or not to take John Mark along. You see, John Mark had been with them on the first journey, but he bailed out. He was a mama's boy. He was a wimp. When the going got tough, he bailed out. He quit. Before the actual persecution actually started, just the dangers of travel had become apparent to him. And he got to a certain point in the journey, and he turned tail and went back to Jerusalem, to Mama's house. And as a result of that, Paul didn't want to take him on the second journey. Paul was the tough guy. Paul said, he's not got what it takes to, to make a journey. I'm not wasting any more time with him. How many of you have ever responded like that to folks? Barnabas, on the other hand, was more tender-hearted. Barnabas could look at John Mark and say, now there's potential in that boy. It's raw potential. It's undeveloped or underdeveloped at this point. But there's potential in that boy, and we need to take him again. Paul said, nothing doing. I ain't taking. I'm not wasting any more time on him. I can see myself saying that. Can you? And then some of the others of you can probably relate to John Mark, saying, oh, give him another chance, you know. Yeah, he messed up, but, you know, there's potential here. You know, and, and so they, they had a disagreement over him. So I know the question that is lurking in your mind at this point is, who was right and who was wrong in this conflict between Paul and Barnabas? Isn't that what we, what we normally think when there's a disagreement? Who's right and who's wrong? And we try to figure out who's wrong and who's right, and we want to line up with who we think is right. Isn't that the way we normally handle conflict? And then all of a sudden you got sides, right? you got them and us deadly way to handle conflict horrible horrible way to handle conflict but that's the way we normally handle it asking that kind of question and here's the answer to that question who was right and who was wrong both of them were right it was not a right and wrong issue whether to take john mark or not take john mark is not a right or wrong issue it is an issue of wisdom and we're going to see that Paul didn't think it was wise to take him again. Not right or wrong, but wise. Barnabas evidently thought it was wise to take him again. Conflicts come in two categories. There are either conflicts over right and wrong, or there are conflicts over wisdom. You think it's wise to do it this way. Somebody else thinks it's wise to do it that way. Paul and Barnabas both wanted to do the same thing. They both wanted to go on another missionary journey. They both wanted to strengthen the churches. They both wanted to do discipleship, something that God said is right. They just had a difference of opinion on the wise way to do it. Either take John Mark or not take John Mark. Do you see how that wasn't a right or wrong issue? It was a wisdom issue. Most of our conflict in churches are over wisdom issues. Not right and wrong issues. Wisdom issues. And I want to show you here 
How I know that Luke identified this conflict as a conflict that related to wisdom rather than a conflict that was a right and wrong issue. It's in verses 37 and 38. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul, here it is, Paul did not think it wise to take him. See, Paul didn't say it's wrong to take him. What did he say? It's not wise to take him. Paul thought it would be a waste of resources and energy and time and all of that. And he just didn't think it was wise to take him. Now, I, this is not in your notes, but I want to stop and explain this to you. And you know, when I say that, that means the sermon is going to be a little longer, right? Um, but I want, to, I want to help you with this. I want to help you with this. At that moment in his life, Paul didn't think it was wise to invest any more time in John Mark. He was a shaker and a mover, a go-getter. He had things to do. He had an agenda, and he wanted to change the world. Later on in his life, as he matured more, as he kind of calmed down and understood God could change the world without him getting all excited about it and getting overly enthused about it and taking matters into his own hands, you know what? You know what Paul decided later on? Because he wrote this to Timothy. Paul's an old man. He knows he's going to die soon. The Romans are going to cut his head off with a sword. He knows that's coming. He's faithful right up until that moment. But he writes to Timothy. And winter's coming, and he's not sure if he's, when he's going to be executed, but he knows that there's a possibility because of his age and his, his diminishing physical abilities and, and, and the severe winter that he knows is coming. He knows that he might not survive the winter if he doesn't have sufficient clothing. So he writes to Timothy and he says, bring my coat and bring the scrolls. Bring my copies of scripture that I left with Carpus and Troas. Bring those to me. And you know what else he said? Bring John Mark because he is profitable for the ministry. You know what he did years later? He changed his mind about John Mark. He decided there was potential in that boy. He decided he is worth salvaging. He is worth an investment in time and energy. He is profitable. You see how his wisdom changed? How a greater level of wisdom was attained as he spent more years in, in, in the presence of the Lord and, and had more experiences in the kingdom of God. And so you see, but it was a wisdom issue. It wasn't a right or a wrong issue. So let's talk about how to handle these conflicts. First thing you got to do is you got to identify what kind of conflict it is. Is it a right and wrong issue or is it a wisdom issue? Because the fact is conflict happens. That's an indisputable fact. And sometimes conflict is related to issues of right and wrong, and sometimes conflict is related to wisdom issues. The important question is not will conflict happen. The two important questions are what kind of conflict is it? A conflict regarding right and wrong or a conflict regarding wisdom? And then the other question is how should we handle it when it does happen? Don't live in a dream world thinking there will be no conflict. There will be conflict. It will happen on your job. It will happen in your family. It will happen at your church. It will happen in every area of life. There will be conflict. The important question is not will there be. The important question is what kind of conflict is it and how are we supposed to handle it? So let's talk about right and wrong conflicts. When a conflict arises over issues of right and wrong, then the approach to take is relatively simple to identify we should always choose to do what is right. That's how you handle that kind of conflict. And if somebody's mad about it, they just have to be mad about it. Now, you'd be gentle and you'd be gracious and you'd be loving and all of that, but you got to do what is right. We must never do wrong or even fail to do what's right in an effort to solve a conflict by accommodating others. The Scripture is very clear about that. Um, James wrote about it in James 4, 17. Remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. It's a sin not to do the right thing because somebody might get mad. Now you've got to pay attention to the timing and you've got to pay attention to how you do it and you've got to pay attention to your attitude and a lot of things. But you've got to do the right thing and you can't fail to do the right thing in order to avoid a conflict. That's pretty clear, isn't it? That's relatively simple. Now, 
When you do that, sometimes when, when, when one of those kind of conflicts arises and somebody is trying to convince you to do something that you believe is wrong, you can't just say, well, I'm not going to do that. That's not right. That's how most of us want to respond, isn't it? That's not the way to handle it. Because then you automatically invite an even deeper conflict. Here's what I've learned to say. I don't say it as often as I should, but here's what I've learned to say regarding those right or wrong issues. Here's the best way that I've ever found to approach that. You let Jesus be the big guy. You don't try to be the big guy. You let Jesus handle it. Here's what you can say. You can say, you know what? I belong to Jesus. He owns me. He died for me. And because I belong to Jesus, I can't do that. You see what that does? It puts the responsibility on him. And then if they want to argue about whether it's right or wrong or, or whatnot, then, then they just need to talk to Jesus about that. And, and you can even tell them that, you know, if you just ask Jesus to show me that it's okay for me to do this, then I'll do it. You see, that way you're not being judgmental. You're not setting yourself up as the one who determines right or wrong. You're saying, as far as I understand Jesus, Jesus doesn't want me to do that. And if Jesus wants me to do that, talk to him about that and ask him to show me. That's a great way to respond to one of those right or wrong conflicts. You're still going to do what's right, but you don't have to just rub it in the face of the other person saying you're just wrong. You don't have to do that because that's just going to push them away. Now, what about wisdom conflicts? Paul and Barnabas gives us a, give us a great example of how to handle these conflicts that are related to wisdom issues. You see, Barnabas thought the wise thing to do was invite John Mark to go on the second missionary journey. It evidently didn't bother him that John had failed to complete the first journey, returning to Jerusalem relatively early in the journey. He must have seen some potential in Mark, and he thought that it would be wise to continue to invest time and effort in discipling him. Luke explained that in, in verse 37 in Acts 15. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. He wanted to take him along again. Paul, on the other hand, didn't think it wise to continue to invest time and energy in discipling a young man who had bailed out on that first journey. Luke explained it in verse number 8. He wrote, excuse me, it's verse number 38. He wrote, but Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and not continued with them in the work. So how did they handle this conflict? They had differences of opinion on what they thought was the wise thing to do. So how did they handle this conflict regarding the wise approach to take in dealing with John Mark? Here's what they did. They devised what I call a creative alternative. A creative alternative that allowed both of them to deal with John Mark in the way each one thought was a wise course of action, while at the same time accomplishing the mission that they both believed God wanted them to achieve. And that mission was strengthening the new churches they had planted on the first journey. Here's the mistake we sometimes make when a conflict arises. And if we're unwise enough to make this kind of mistake, the devil will always bring up conflicts over wisdom issues in order to keep us from doing what we know we ought to do. Sometimes what we do is we get so off focus, instead of focusing on what God wants us to do, we start focusing on the difference of opinion regarding the wise approach to take that we never get around to actually doing what it was we were supposed to be doing to begin with. We get so caught up in our disagreement that we don't actually do what we're supposed to be doing. They were smarter than that. They didn't throw out the baby with the bathwater. They were much too smart for that. Even though they disagreed on the wise approach to take, they did know that it was God's will for them to disciple these new churches, and they did it. Here's how they did it. Here's the creative alternative, alternative that they came up with that allowed both of them to pursue the course of action that they thought was wise while at the same time strengthening these new, these new churches. They divided up the territory they had covered on the first journey into two sections. In that first journey, they had gone through Syria and Cilicia. They had sailed to the island of Cyprus. They had covered this huge amount of territory on their first journey. They divided that territory up into two sections. And Barnabas and John Mark revisited the churches on the island of Cyprus because Barnabas wanted to take John Mark. 
And so he got to take John Mark and they revisited the churches on the island of Cyprus while Paul and Silas revisited the churches in Syria and Cilicia. Luke described how the plan unfolded when he wrote the words of Acts 15, 39 through 41. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So you see, their creative alternative allowed both of them to do what they believed to be the wise approach, but yet still accomplish what they were supposed to be doing, which is discipling, strengthening these new churches. So when conflicts regarding wisdom issues are handled properly, the work of God's kingdom goes on unhindered. And in this case, that work was strengthening the churches. Do you get the point? We may not always agree on how to get the job done, and we need to come up with creative alternatives that allows everybody to use the wisdom God has given them in their pursuit of getting the job done. But the real issue is, are we going to get the job done? Are we going to evangelize people and then disciple them so that they can become consistent, devoted followers of Jesus? There are dozens of different ways to do that. And some think this way is better and somebody else might think this way is better. Just I like the Nike commercial. Just do it. You get that? Just do it. Now, how does this apply to a church? Here's how it applies to a church. In, in our particular situation, we, we're, the elders are always looking at outreach opportunities to win people to Christ, to disciple people and all that stuff. And we got, we got three or four different things going on and, and headed in that direction, trying to make sure that we do everything we can to do that. And, 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 and we do one thing, and, and a group of people say, yeah, man, that's a great thing to do. That's a wise thing to do. And they, and they got all excited about this, and they jump in and do that. And then there's another group of people that say, I just don't like that at all. I, it's just not me. I don't like that. And they got all kinds of reasons for not doing that. And it's all wisdom issues. It's not that anybody says evangelism is not right or discipleship is not right. It's how to approach it. So how does that look in our situation if we're going to come up with a creative alternative? Here's what we do. We don't expect everybody to participate in everything. If there's a ministry going on that's designed to disciple or to evangelize people and you just don't fit into that and that's not doesn't fit in with your idea of what's wise, then don't participate in that. Leave it alone. But let those people participate in that who believe that's a good thing to do. And then there may be something else over here that's going on and you say, man, this is what we ought to be doing. This is a good way for this to happen. This is how we win people. This is how we disciple people. This is what we ought to be doing. Then you know what I say to you? Jump in. Jump in and do that. Make that happen. Get all the way up to your neck in it. Do it. Do you get that? Just participate in what you believe is the wise thing to do and let the other people have permission to do the same thing. Here's in our carnal, fallen condition, if we're not careful, here's what we'll do. Even with, with, with eight different good things going on, one thing going on that you don't think is the best thing to do, the wise thing to do, if you're not really, really careful, you'll just chunk it all. Isn't that true? You'll just throw it all out. You'll just back off and won't participate in anything. How ridiculous is that? What we need to do is we just need to say, I'm going to do what God shows me as the wise thing to do to evangelize and disciple people and then motivate them to worship the Lord who saved them and who they are following. That's pretty simple. Isn't that what these guys did? They had a difference of opinion about how to get the job done, but they were still committed to getting the job done. So here's a conclusion. I want you to... I want you to understand that conflict will arise in churches. Differences of opinion, sometimes regarding right and wrong. Those are relatively simple. Sometimes regarding wisdom issues. It isn't a question of if the conflict will arise. It's a question of when it will arise. And for that reason, God wants his people to learn the art of making. And he promises to bless those who do. If we're going to have conflict, don't we really need some people who can help solve conflict? And you know what somebody, when they help solve a conflict, you know what they are? A peacemaker. A peacemaker. We need people who are like that. During his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said this. It's in Matthew chapter 5, verse number 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. 
The mere fact that Jesus identified a certain group of people in the church as peacemakers and promises to bless them is ample proof that at times there will not be peace. Isn't that true? And so there's going to be conflict. There's going to be times when everything's not peaceful. But blessed are the peacemakers. They'll be called the children of God. I want you to notice two important facts that emerge from this verse. First of all, people who learn to bring peace into conflictual situations are blessed. They are blessed. Jesus said it. Blessed are the peacemakers. If you really want to be blessed, learn to make peace in conflictual situations. The second thing is, nothing identifies us as authentic children of God like being peacemakers. I mean, people look at you and you're a peacemaker and they say, that person really is a child of God. That, that person really does belong to God. Jesus said, they will be called, they will be identified as the children of God. Nothing will boost your testimony as a child of God like learning to be a peacemaker. Now, those who learn how to lead the church to handle conflict appropriately receive God's approval. How many of you really would like to have God's approval? In your more spiritual moments, you really want God's approval. You know how to get God's approval? One way to get it? In fact, this is, this is a, one of the clearest statements about, about getting God's approval that I can find in the whole scripture. It's learn how to bring peace into conflict. Learn how to help people settle these wisdom conflicts by being able to propose, propose a creative alternative that allows us to get the job done and allows everybody to operate at their level of wisdom. Here's how I know that. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 18 and 19. Paul wrote to this church at Corinth, and they were having a conflict. No doubt about it. They were having a conflict. I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. What is it when there are divisions among you? Conflict. There's conflict going on in that church. No doubt, there have to be differences among you. I, I struggled with that for a long time. God says, there have to be differences among you. What does that mean? There have to be differences among you. What does that mean? It means they're necessary. From time to time, it is necessary. For conflict to break out in the church and you say, that's crazy. Not from God's perspective, because look at what he goes on to say. There have to be differences among you. Why? Why does God allow these conflicts from time to time? To show which of you have God's approval. What's he saying there? Conflict breaks out. Some peacemaker steps up. Comes up with a creative alternative. Helps solve the conflict. Everybody gets to use their wisdom. Everybody gets to accomplish the goal, maybe in slightly different ways, but we're working toward the goal. And when that person steps up and does that, what do the rest of us know, according to this? They have God's approval. Isn't that what he said there? Look at that verse again. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So men and women who are equipped to help us appropriately handle conflict have God's approval. Now let me ask you a question again. Understanding that that's how you get God's approval, how many of you still want it? <laughs> yeah, we should want it to be able to help handle those conflicts in an appropriate way. So a disagreement is not a bad thing. A disagreement gives God the opportunity to show who among us he, he's going to put his hand of approval on. A disagreement can help us learn a, a, a new view on wisdom. It, it can help us learn to look at a situation from a little different aspect. It may help us understand that there's something we're not considering that we need to consider about how to go about this. The important thing is that we get the job done. The secondary thing is how we get the job done. And let's give everybody the freedom to be on the level of wisdom they're on at any given time. How many of you can look back at your life and say, I'm glad people didn't jump all over me when I was way back there and didn't have an, much wisdom at that point? Can, can you be there? Then who in the world are you to look at somebody else who's on a different level of wisdom and write them off? You get it? We just need to have the freedom to be where we are with the Lord, who we are with the Lord, and go ahead and get the job done. And disagreements. 
are a good way for us to measure if we're really doing that in every church.